Hello everybody, my name is William Thomas. I'm part of the kinesiology fac uh, faculty here at Cal State Fullerton. Today, uh, in addition to that, I'm uh, the current 2019, although we had no 2020 race, uh, California State time trial champion overall. Um, today I'm gonna deconstruct the FT ba FTP based training myth and um, I know that's kind of a, might be kind of shocking to you, but I'm going to tell you why it is inadequate. So, first of all, how was FTP developed? FTP was developed as a performance um, variable based upon doing a field test revolving around 60 minute maximal power. Now, 60 minute maximal power is not a physiological attribute or a physiological variable. It is a rather arbitrary variable. So when we're talking about performance and adaptations and recovery to develop a, a, uh, a training model around and, uh, and recovery model around, you need to rely on a physiological based model, not an arbitrary performance based model revolving around 60 minute power. And let me tell you exactly why that's the case. First of all, I was thinking about this TSS training model based around FTP suggests that if you were to go out and do a one hour FTP test, in other words, a maximal effort for 60 minutes, that you would be able to recover fully 100% within 24 hours. Now we know that that is not the case whether you're a untrained person, a trained person, or a world-class athlete. Eventually doing a one hour time trial every day is going to wind up, you're going to wind up accumulating fatigue. Now, so why is it developed around this FTP construct? And I'll tell you right now, it's because mostly because of convenience, convenience. So we know that this is not true. So a 100 TSS training score, training stress score is not necessarily um, going to be fully recoverable within 24 hours. Now, there's a number of ways that you can do a 100 TSS uh, score. You can do that by doing a one hour time trial. You can do that a sub-maximal trial for many hours. You can do a uh, over under type of a, a training trial to get this 100 TSS. But to suggest 100 TSS does not produce any residual fatigue after 24 hours is false. So that sets a person up if they were to consistently train at 100 TSS to eventually get to a point to where they're going to overtrain, but the modeling program tells them that they're just perfectly fine. They should not be overtrained. So let me tell you exactly why it shouldn't be your, that breaking point should not revolve around FTP. In other words, that training stress breaking point should not revolve around your one hour maximal power. And it has to do with physiological reasoning. So, number one, take a look at this recruitment order. So the recruitment order, um, the motor unit recruitment order chart suggests that at about 40% VO2 max from rest to 40% VO2 max, we recruit type one slow muscle fibers. Now, what are those? Type one slow muscle fibers are very fatigue resistant. So I have a plus plus here, very fatigue resistant. That means by training in this zone, you're gonna be able to do that for a long time without accumulating fatigue. Now, what happens when we trickle up above 40%, let's say up to 75% VO2 max, now we're gonna wind up recruiting both type ones and these fast fibers called type 2As, which are also known as FFRs or fast fatigue resistant fibers. Now these happen to be the most changeable in that depending on how you train them, they're gonna become more, if you're training more like from an endurance perspective, they're gonna have more endurance. If you train them more from a strength 
perspective, they're going to hypertrophy more and you're going to be able to develop more strength. So they're a very plastic fiber. So this is why training in this zone gets you a lot of bang for the buck because 2As are very plastic and changeable or type 1s and 2Xs are not. Now, 2As are also fatigue resistant. Now, not to the same aspect as type 1s, but they're pretty close. So I like to put a single plus mark here that shows that type 2As, especially if they're trained from an endurance perspective, are very or fairly fatigue resistant. Now what happens when we get up to the 75% VO2 max point, we reach what's called your lactate threshold. Or also your lactate threshold is also going to occur around what's called your uh, sweet spot or, or sweet spot tempo or SST um, training zone. Now this occurs below your FTP. In fact, with regards to trained endurance athletes, and I'm, and I'm assuming that most of you are trained or in the process of training, so this is going to be you, your FTP is in fact about 10% higher than your lactate threshold. Now realize this, lactate threshold is a physiological variable. FTP is not a physiological variable. Okay, so 10% higher. That's what we see here. 80 to 85%. It could actually even be a little bit higher than this. The problem along with this, your FTP also correlates with what's called your maximal lactate steady state. It is not your lactate threshold. The problem, the problem with this is you start recruiting a significant portion of 2x fast fatigable or FF fibers. These fibers have a terrible fatigue resistance. So what happens is when you're consistently doing volume and training, uh, and again, it's volume is the greatest thing. So if you do 10 seconds uh, at your FTP, it's not gonna contribute to a lot of fatigue. But if you do an hour at your FTP where you're, you're training a lot of these 2X fibers, you're going to produce some residual fatigue. When you don't, when you're below that LT, you don't recruit a significant amount of 2X fibers and it's fairly easy to recover from. Now, why do we train at our FTP? Why don't we train at our LT? Exactly, we should train at our LTP, LT because it has to do with one of our training principles, specificity. So if you want to raise your lactate threshold, you need to train your lactate threshold. And when you go above it, you can't train those specific muscle tissues as long. In fact, SST or LT training can produce superior results in power at your lactate threshold due to specificity, you're actually training your lactate threshold, and the potential volume. When you go 100% FTP, you cannot accumulate the same volume when you go 90% FTP or around your lactate threshold. Many of you have been doing may have been doing 20 minute intervals prescribed by your coach. They may not actually know why they're prescribing that, but I'm telling you that's the reason why you do it is because you get gains in your lactate threshold, but you're able to recover from those because you're doing them around your LT and not your FTP. So you can do more volume without as much fatigue, accumulating fatigue. Now, why, has, why have they chosen FTP? Again, it revolves around the 60 minute construct but it has very little physiological reasoning. So how, as an athlete, can you determine your lactate threshold power? And there's a couple ways you can do this. First of all, you can do 90% of your FTP, or what, what I have found is around 85% of your 25, of your 20 minute power should produce a, uh, your lactate threshold power or 85% of your 20 minute power. Another, perhaps a better way, 
is to do a ramp test where you gradually increase the watts over a period of time. Let's say you increase it 20 watts every minute or you could do 10 watts every minute and you'll get to a point what's going to happen is that your perceived exertion is going to go up at a nice linear rate along with what's called your ventilatory rate or your minute ventilation. It's going to go up at a nice linear rate and then eventually as you continue to increase the watts you're going to get to a breaking point where not only your perceived exertion increases at a disproportional rate but also your ventilation increases at a, at a disproportional rate. At this point where your perceived exertion goes up disproportionately with the watt increase and your ventilation goes up disproportionately with the watt increase is going to be right around your lactate threshold. That will be where you need to sit, if not a little bit lower, to maximize gains in lactate threshold power and minimize fatigue. Um, yeah, so that should help you in terms of developing a training program that is physiological based and not arbitrary base like FTP to maximize your, um, your power increases, your aerobic power increases while minimizing fatigue. All right. So what else do I want to talk about here? Oh, this is just, I just put up, up here for reference. You'll see that at hundred percent VO2 max, we're not recruiting all of our 2X muscle fibers. Right? When you start doing strength training, that's when you really get up and you're recruiting a lot of 2X fibers, which is why strength training, you typically do the same muscle group twice a week and that's good enough. Right? So it's, pretty diff it's even harder to recover from strength training because of these 2X fibers. A lot, of them, a lot more of them are recruited. Um, yeah, so um, after this, I'll go ahead and answer questions, should you have any. And, um, and we'll go from there. But again, FTP is not physiological based. Lactate threshold is physiological based. And this is how you're, you're going to determine it. You can determine it using 85% of your 20 minute power, or you can determine it on a ramp test where you gradually increase the wattage. And, and uh, when you get to a point to where your ventilation and perceived exertion skew up um, quickly, that's gonna be around your lactate threshold. All right, thanks for joining me and I'll go ahead and answer some questions should you have them.
So to conclude, um, I would use your power at lactate threshold. You can, you can do that, if, again, a few ways. The, uh, the gold standard way would be come in and do a ramp test here, and we can check your blood lactate. The other ways you can do it, a little bit more convenient, is to use 85% of your 20-minute uh, power, or you can do a ramp test where you gradually increase the watts over a period of time, and as your heart rate and ventilatory rate um, and perceived exertion climb with the watts when you get to a point to where your perceived exertion and your ventilation increase at a more rapid ascent than the wattage, um, that's going to be around your lactate threshold too. So for example, you might go from 200 watts to 210 watts, 220 watts, 230 watts, and everything is increasing linearly. And then you get to a point to where you feel your perceived exertion has shot up and you start ventilating um, at a more um, um, ex expedited rate. Um, and then that's gonna be around your lactate threshold. So, or you could do a combination of both. You can do 85% of your 20 minute plus that ramp test um, for convenience. So we have a few questions. Somebody asking if they can watch it from the beginning. The video will be available to view. Uh, say that again. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I would, instead of constructing your training around FTP, I would construct it around your lactate threshold. And the, um, I just talked about how you can estimate your lactate threshold. Um, of course, you can come into the lab and we could do a ramp test and actually physically check your blood lactate. But I just talked about how you can estimate your lactate threshold in the field doing a ramp test or using 85% of your 20 minute power versus the standard 95% versus your FTP. So it's around going to be around 10% lower than your FTP. So how you can use that is you can use that as your breaking point um, instead of FTP as your breaking point. So um, I would train in a manner where I accumulate a lot of volume if uh, in the late off season around this lactate threshold. So I like to, I like to structure my training in a polarized method that includes um, uh, zone one, which is very low intensity, uh, long, slow distance type of intensity, in addition to doing sweet spot training, which is going to be your lactate threshold. So doing long efforts at sweet spot. Now, again, the benefit of this is by not training above that lactate threshold around your FTP, you're going to be able to accumulate more volume produce good effects because it is specific with regards to your physiology and not produce a lot of fatigue. So in, that, in essence, you're going to raise your lactate threshold, which is the primary driver of your FTP, believe it or not, and not have a lot of fatigue. So when you start doing really high intensity training, you um, don't get into a period of overtraining um, or an overtrained state relatively quickly. So this, this manner, you're allowed to raise your FTP without accumulating undue fatigue, just by keeping it at or below that point. Now, what I like to do is once we, I start to see plateauing effect in my athletes, in other words, they, 
They continually raise, we do field tests, and they continually raise their power, but still keeping within this percentage. Once I start to see a more a plateauing effect, then we start to build in more of the real higher training stuff. Um, but by training in this manner to where they're not so close to their FTP, it should produce good, what I call race-based power, lactate threshold power, without uh, accumulating a lot of undue fatigue. So save the really high intensity stuff for the icing on the cake. The cake is your sweet spot. The icing is your really high intensity, your explosive stuff, your sprinting, your VO2 stuff, which produces a lot of fatigue. Save that for, I like to at least like six weeks before a major race, start doing that type of stuff. But milk, and when I say milk, milk the gains that you get from sweet spot first before you move on to that stuff. Uh, and one caveat, some people just have to do some high intensity during the week, hammer a hill or whatever like that because they might get bored or whatever. That's just fine. You can do once a week, you can do, you know, hammer the hills or do sprints with your buddies or practice or whatever, that's fine. But to, to consistently overload really high intensity stuff in the off season, not very close to a race is not, is not a good idea. So what would that else? This is not true. People that do a one hour time trial will accumulate fatigue if they do it in, an, in a daily manner. So I started looking at why is that? So I'm like, well, I know why that is. I know because physiologically speaking, FTP is, is, is nothing. It's a arbitrary power me metric basically so that everybody can use, say, okay, well, 60 minutes is gonna be pretty close and everybody can go out there and test their 60 minute power, but not everybody can check their lactate threshold, right? But this leads into problems. So my suggestion is to conservative, right? Always best to be a little conservative. Move that down. First of all, LT is highly correlated with FTP power. So if you train at your LT, chances are your FTP is gonna go up. But by training um, at FTP or LT, you're not going, you're going to be able to do more volume without undue accumulated fatigue. So another thing that got me thinking, it's a common training uh, a session that coaches give. Oh, do tw three 20 minute, this is so common, do three 20 minute efforts, 90 to 95% of your FTP. Uh, and that's a, that's a good uh, FTP training session. Why would you do three 90 to 95, why not just do 100%? If you can do 100% for 60 minutes, why not just do 100%? Why not do 105%? 105% technically is your 20 minute power. But you know what I mean, right? This is the reason because, and people don't understand this is the reason. It's because when you're training at your FTP, you're accelerating fatigue fast. And when you train below it, you're not accelerating fatigue to the same extent. And you reap almost all of the gains. So people can do these three 25 minute or three 20 minute sessions at 90 to 95% FTP multiple days a week without getting burned out. 